Special Forces A detachments have been employed on numerous operations throughout the world. Since 1975, nearly 500 mobile training teams from Fort Bragg and other commands have been employed in 58 different countries. We are prepared to accomplish these and any assigned mission at any time. Inherent to Special Forces training is basic self-defense. Techniques we'll demonstrate here this morning may be used against small arms and improvised weapons. During the demonstration, pay particular attention to the knife edge of the hand, the elbows, knees, heel and toe of the boot. Demonstration will consist of escapes from the front and rear, the knife, pistol, and bayonet disarm. A detachments are highly skilled, intensively trained teams. A detachment is innovative, and often the success of a mission depends on flexibility. An A detachment never stops learning. Underwater operations is one method of water infiltration. The Special Forces diver may be equipped with either the wetsuit or the DUI dry suit to protect him from the cold. This jumper is rigged with a rough terrain suit which is utilized should it be necessary to insert into an unimproved drop zone such as mountainous terrain or in trees. Notice the special helmet with full face mask and the special padded areas to protect critical portions of the body. This is the P7 pistol. Fires a 9mm parabellum round made in Germany. This is the P35 Browning high power pistol fires a 9mm parabellum made in Belgium. The dental set and the mobile laboratory set which enables the medic to perform basic laboratory skills in the field. A detachment medical personnel are trained in hospital operating room procedures. These items are of the demolitions kit which affords the detachment with electrical as well as non-electrical firing capabilities of high explosives. This is the MP5A3, this is the MP5 Kilo. Both weapons are similar and fire a 9mm parabellum round. Weapons are submachine guns and are made in Germany. The equipment you see displayed may be either worn or carried into the operational area by individual detachment members. More equipment might be carried as dictated by the mission However, in Special Forces, emphasis is placed on highly trained individuals operating with a minimum amount of equipment. This jumper is rigged for standard static line parachute insertion. Along with his individual weapon and equipment, he is equipped with the T-10 Reserve and the MC-1-1 Bravo main parachute. Many Special Forces missions require entry into and exit out of places without discovery by local authorities or military forces. Waterborne operations include underwater demolitions, navigation, and swimming with open and closed breathing apparatus. Small boat skills are also used. A detachments are highly experienced in air operations, whether it be a normal helicopter move forward, a clandestine insertion, or a sudden extraction. The United States Air Force often provides aircraft for special operations forces. The jumps may be a normal static line jump, or it may be halo, high altitude, low opening jump.
A halo jump often is employed on clandestine missions. The team exits at high altitude wearing oxygen masks and cold weather gear. Free fall to low altitude, then maneuver with directional steering chutes to a specific small target rendezvous. Unconventional warfare is one mission of special forces. It may be conducted in remote, urban, or rural environments in times of peace or war. Special forces are also prepared to accomplish other missions such as survival, evasion, resistance, escape, strike, subversion, economy of force, recovery operations, and air interdiction missions in support of United States national objectives. Foreign internal defense, unconventional warfare, strategic reconnaissance, strike operations. We are ready. Special operations forces consist of five elements. Special forces, civil affairs, psychological operations, special operations aviation, and rangers. And now, civil affairs. Members of the United States Armed Forces must comply with the provisions of international agreements and law when dealing with the people and governmental agencies of a host or liberated territory. The United States Armed Forces must also comply with the provisions of United States national law. There are four basic missions of civil affairs. United States Army civil affairs soldiers support general purpose forces missions in wartime by identifying for the tactical commander local civilian resources, facilities, and support for U.S. forces through area studies and on-the-ground area surveys. Civil affairs soldiers also assist in minimizing local population interference with U.S. military operations. An example of this is refugee or displaced persons evacuation and care. United States Army Civil Affairs soldiers support special operations forces conducting foreign internal defense missions during peacetime and pre-crisis by training, advising, and assisting host nation military forces in mobilizing and motivating its citizens to assist their government and military forces. An example would be teaching host nation military forces how to plan, train for, and conduct civic action projects such as digging wells, road construction, and other such projects that will enhance the image of the host nation government and military forces in the eyes of the local citizens. United States Army Civil Affairs soldiers support special operations forces in unconventional warfare missions by providing civil affairs analysis of the political, economic, and social vulnerabilities of the area of operations, and by giving training in this analysis to unconventional warfare units. An example of this assistance is a civil affairs EEI, or Essential Elements of Information Briefing, prior to a Special Operations Forces mission. I'm here to give you your CA portion of the brief Urgent Fury. In this AO, the language will generally not be a problem. A majority of the population speaks English, even though they speak a Creole English, which is a French-based English, or you may hear some speaking with a Australian accent or a heavy British accent. United States Army Civil Affairs soldiers also support civil administration missions directed by the National Command Authority. These civil administration missions include assisting a host government to improve or maintain a stable and viable civil government or establishing a temporary civil administration in friendly territory where U.S. forces are located in order to maintain order and temporarily provide life-sustaining services until the host government can be reestablished. Additionally, civil affairs forces can establish a civil administration in enemy territory occupied by U.S. forces to provide for life-sustaining services such as water, electricity, to maintain order, and to control the distribution of goods and services within the occupied territory until autonomy is restored to civil authorities as directed by the National Command Authority. Civil affairs operations are those activities conducted in peace and in war, which facilitate the relationship among U.S. military forces, civil authorities, and people in a nation in which those military forces are operating. In a free country, these activities are accomplished through coordination with local officials when possible. 
They are covered by a treaty or an agreement such as a status of forces agreement. Civil affairs personnel require language proficiency and area expertise in their area of operation. Now, psychological operations. The purpose of all psychological operations is to create in foreign groups the emotions, the attitudes, and the behavior to support the achievement of national objectives. Psychological operations, PSYOP, will influence policy and decisions, the ability to govern, the ability to command, the will to fight, the will to support, the will to win. Psychological operations can increase the combat power of friendly forces and adversely affect the combat power of the enemy. This is accomplished basically by attacking the identified weaknesses of the opposing forces through a planned and coordinated PSYOP campaign. The PSYOP tools are radio, television, leaflets, newspapers. Let's get that to the press as soon as you can. Right. Loudspeakers. and face-to-face -face communication. The recent Grenada action provided a classic example of psychological operations. PSYOP teams went in with the first combat troops, and they stayed after the troops were gone. Television was not used in Grenada. There were very few sets in the country. But in another situation where those few TVs were owned by key government personnel or other leaders, television would have been an ideal medium to use. United States Army PSYOP personnel are trained and prepared to support in these actions. And many times there are peacetime PSYOP needs before armed conflict breaks out. PSYOP effectively builds combat power, both strategically and tactically. When combat units are required to adopt a defensive posture, PSYOP can remain on the offense. In retrograde operations, PSYOP provides civilian control measures and can support counterattacks. In relief operations, PSYOP can remain to support the incoming unit. In consolidation operations, PSYOP will reorient and educate the civilian population in liberated or occupied areas. The United States Army PSYOP mission is to support U.S. national policy, to support military operations, and to be prepared to conduct PSYOP unilaterally or in support of other military services and United States government agencies. We also give PSYOP training, advice, and assistance to other U.S. armed forces and friendly nations. Psychological operations create a favorable image, gain popular support, and weaken enemy forces. PSYOP is now a major weapon in 20th century warfare. Now, Special Operations Aviation. Special Operations Forces Aviation basically turns on two things. They are the different aircraft available, as well as the tactics to be used. Naturally, both are determined by the mission. We may use the UH-60 Blackhawk or the UH-1H Huey helicopter to complete the assigned mission. Most of the Special Operations Forces missions are clandestine and high risk. Therefore, we will use many tactics, and seldom do we fly in a straight line. As well, we are trained in techniques and procedures for air operations in support of unconventional warfare, which may be applied to other Special Operations missions. Special Operations Forces Aviation is prepared to fly on short notice anywhere in the world. The primary mission of the Military Airlift Command's Special Operations Units is to support the Army's Special Operations Forces. Our support consists of infiltration behind enemy lines, resupply of food, munitions, and equipment, exfiltration from objective areas after mission completion, firepower and support of ground forces, and leaflet dissemination and radio TV broadcast missions 
which enhance the overall PSYOP campaign. The commander of the recently formed 23rd Air Force directs the USAF special operations efforts through the 2nd Air Division located at Herbert Field, Florida. The Air Division's subordinate units consist of the 1st Special Operations Wing with three Special Operations Squadrons. Other units include the 1st Special Operations Squadron, Clark Air Base, Philippines, the 7th Special Operations Squadron, Rhein-Main Air Base, Germany, Detachment 1, Howard Air Force Base, Panama, and the Special Operations School, also at Hurlburt. Let's examine our Special Operations aircraft. This is the MC-130 E-model aircraft, which is commonly known as the Combat Talon, or Blackbird. Its special features include a terrain following and terrain avoidance radar system, which permits low-level penetration of enemy territory so as to avoid radar detection. Its sophisticated navigational package allows it to pinpoint hard-to-find drop zones and landing areas. The Combat Talon can also exfiltrate forces from unimproved landing zones when they are available. However, when these landing zones are not available, one of the rotary wing members of the Special Operations family provides the greatest capability. The HH-53H Pavlo 3 helicopter also possesses special equipment that gives it unique capabilities. Its terrain following terrain avoidance radar provides a night all-weather capability for long-range infiltration and exfiltration missions. The best source of firepower is the AC-130 gunship. The H models are flown by the active force, and the older A models are manned by the Air Force Reserves. The AC-130's ability to support ground units with surgical and timely firepower was well demonstrated in the recent actions in Grenada. The gunship can attack critical enemy positions without jeopardizing nearby civilians or causing unnecessary collateral damage. The gunship's infrared and low light level television systems allow it to search for and acquire targets at night. Once the target is acquired, one of four weapon systems can be used. The two 7.62 miniguns are effective against personnel in the open. The two 20 millimeter Vulcan cannons can be used against light trucks and personnel. The 40 millimeter cannon proved itself as a truck killer during the war in Vietnam, and the H model's 105 millimeter cannon is effective against enemy bunkers, lightly armored vehicles, and personnel. Both the gunship and the combat Talon are equipped with in-flight refueling capability to provide for longer range and increased station time. The United States Air Force Special Operations personnel and equipment can provide the support needed to get the job done. And now, Rangers. The primary mission of Ranger units is strike operations. This includes raids, against high-value targets, interdiction of lines of communications, recovery operations of sensitive equipment or personnel, and any mission assigned by higher authority. Rangers are the primary light infantry ground force available to U.S. planners for the conduct and support of special operations. They can be deployed anywhere in the world on short notice by land, air, or sea supporting United States resolve or support of allied nations or host countries. The employment of such a force provides a clear signature of our readiness to commit combat forces to protect U.S. interests abroad. Rangers are elite forces composed of highly trained and motivated soldiers. All are airborne qualified and most are Ranger qualified. A unique thing about Rangers is that they are four-time volunteers. They volunteer for the Army, they volunteer for airborne training, and then they volunteer to serve in one of the Ranger battalions. After serving in a rifle squad for a reasonable amount of time and being selected by their chain of command, finally they volunteer for attendance at the United States Army Ranger School. Rangers are highly trained in light infantry tactics. 
They receive extensive training in patrolling techniques, airborne, and air mobile operations. To enhance their capabilities, rangers conduct off-post deployments to include jungle, desert, and arctic environments each year. Selected members of each battalion conduct special skills training in advanced demolitions, scuba, and halo insertion techniques. Special Forces, Civil Affairs, Psychological Operations, Special Operations Aviation, Rangers. Those are the five components of the Special Operations Forces. The 5th Special Forces Group is stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, with three battalions. The 7th Special Forces Group is also stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, with two battalions, while its 3rd Battalion is in Panama, and under the operational control of SOUTHCOM, or Southern Command. The 10th Special Forces Group is stationed at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, with two battalions and one battalion deployed to Germany and under the operational control of UCOM, or the European Command. The 1st Special Forces Group will be reactivated soon. It should be noted that 58% of the Army's Special Forces strength rests in reserve units. There are two U.S. Army Reserve Special Forces Groups, the 11th and the 12th, and two Army National Guard Special Forces Groups, the 19th and the 20th. The 96th Civil Affairs Battalion and the 4th Psychological Group are the only units of their kind in the active Army structure. Both are stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. About 99% of our Civil Affairs assets and about 80% of our PSYOP assets are in reserve components. Currently, there are two U.S. Army Ranger battalions. One is stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, and the other at Fort Stewart, Georgia. They, too, are a part of the Special Operations Command. Plans are currently underway to expand Ranger forces. Special Operations forces function under many varied command and control arrangements. The exact structure is determined by the assigned mission, tasks, and the requirements of the commander. Let me show you some fairly typical SOF command and control situations. Usually there is a Special Operations Command headquarters. The SOC is a joint headquarters with staff representatives from all U.S. unconventional warfare forces, as well as non-military agencies, and includes its own combat service support elements. An SOC may be formed to satisfy UW requirements. It is subordinate to an area unified command, and usually it is a semi-permanent arrangement. The Special Forces Operating Base is a command post type arrangement formed and operated by the Special Forces groups from organic and attached resources. It is the focal point for operational, administrative, logistical, and communication support functions. To extend the span of control of the SFOB when distances involved preclude effective command or support of deployed operational elements, a forward operating base may be deployed. The organization and function of the FOB will vary with the mission, duration, and scope of operations, and security, communication, administrative, and logistical support requirements. For example, it may operate as an intermediate command and control base, a forward launch recovery site, or a radio relay site. The unconventional warfare operating area is where the special operations forces perform their mission. Now, let me put them all together in seven of the most common relationships for special operations forces. The most common relationship for the Special Forces Operating Base is to direct all operations in the UWOA. It provides command, control, administrative, and logistical support for all its detachments in the UWOA, as well as those awaiting deployment at the SFOB. In this situation, 
The SOC exercises command and control over special forces detachments in the UWOA. This may be for sensitive missions where positive control and maximum security measures are required. Those detachments awaiting deployment remain under the command and control of the SFOB. Deployed detachments may communicate directly with the SFOB for administrative and logistical support. Theater UW missions may require the establishment of an FOB as a separate control headquarters reporting to a command other than the main SFOB. In this situation, the FOB provides direct command, control, administrative, and logistical support for all of its detachments. The FOB coordinates with the SFOB for operational, administrative, and logistical support as required. An FOB may be established as an intermediate control headquarters to extend the span of control, support, or communications of the SFOB. The Special Forces Group has the organic assets to establish two forward operating bases. In this situation, the FOB may be employed using a subordinate FOB to further extend its span of control, support, or communication. In this situation, a core area of intelligence interest encompasses the UWOA, although UW operations are beyond the core areas of influence. U.S. UW forces are intended primarily to support the theater or unified command, and the majority of intelligence information gathered by UW forces is of interest to and for use by these commands. The sensitive nature of UW operations requires adherence to principles of compartmentation and strict security. Intelligence flow would follow existing lines of command and control with appropriate information being passed to the core commander by the theater or unified commander. However, an SF liaison party may be provided by the SFOB to support the core headquarters at this time. The SF liaison party stays abreast of activities within the UWOA and informs the core commander and staff. It makes continuing reports on matters within the scope of its mission, keeps appropriate records, and advises the Corps commander of reports sent back to the SFOB. In particular, it ensures the timely flow of intelligence from the UWOA through the SFOB to the liaison party at Corps headquarters. Communications and operational security are essential to the survivability of UW forces in the UWOA and therefore only critical essential elements of information or EEI requirements should be selected for collection by special forces elements. The SFOB retains command and control and provides administrative and logistical support to the operational detachments in the UWOA. During this situation, a core area of influence closes on the UWOA and operations of either conventional ground forces or UW forces impact directly on the other. This may dictate passage of operational control of appropriate UW forces to the conventional commander. Close coordination and a rapid, timely flow of intelligence information must be maintained between UW and conventional forces. At this time, a special forces liaison party is normally provided by the SFOB to the Corps headquarters. The liaison party can provide the conventional commander with intelligence of interest assistance in link-up planning and passage of operational control of UW forces, and advice on special forces employment during and after link-up. The mission, the size, the composition of resistance forces, the enemy situation, and the political situation are some of the factors influencing the selection of special operations forces which may deploy into an unconventional warfare operating area. The same factors influence command and control. The terms war and warfare have acquired different meanings over the years. Today, there is little probability that a formal declaration of war by one nation upon another will occur, except in conflict situations at the higher end of the conflict spectrum, or as a last desperate measure to ensure the survival of a nation. 
The conflict spectrum ranges from high probability, low risk situations, such as terrorism and unconventional warfare, to low probability, high risk situations, including nuclear war. How does such a spectrum apply to special operations forces? The National Command Authority needs forces which have a capacity to work and win in the twilight and fuzzy gray areas between general peace and general war. Special operations forces specifically possess that capability. We define a low intensity conflict as the limited use of force for political purposes by nations or organizations in order to coerce, control, or defend a population or territory or certain rights. It includes military operations by or against irregular forces, peacekeeping operations, terrorism, counterterrorism, and rescues, and military assistance under conditions of armed conflict. This level of conflict does not include protracted engagement of opposing regular forces. We define a mid-intensity conflict as a limited use of force for political purposes by nations or organizations in order to gain permanent or temporary control of territory through the use of regular armed forces. This form of conflict does not include the use of nuclear weapons. Mid-intensity conflict may include some or all of the techniques and characteristics of low-intensity conflict. We define high-intensity conflict as the unlimited use of force by one or more nations to gain or protect territory. This form of conflict includes the use of nuclear weapons and may include some or all of the techniques and characteristics of low and mid-intensity conflict. At the lower end of the conflict spectrum, special operations forces can perform several missions, the two most significant being unconventional warfare and foreign internal defense. Pre-crisis operations allow United States decision makers to become involved in foreign areas of national interest while their range of policy options is still wide open. These operations enable the United States to assist countries in maintaining and improving their own security before a situation has deteriorated to the extent that conventional forces are required. Thus, the potential for intensified, higher risk, higher visibility conflict is decreased. Special operations forces give the National Command Authority needed flexibility in responding to threats at levels below conventional war and in a form and fashion appropriate to the challenge. Military operations conducted by these special operations forces utilize highly trained, equipped, and organized DOD resources against strategic or tactical targets in pursuit of national, military, political, economic, or psychological objectives. They may support conventional military operations, or they may be committed independently when the use of conventional forces is either inappropriate or unfeasible. Sensitive peacetime operations are normally authorized and conducted under the direction of the NCA or the designated commander. Special operations may include unconventional warfare, counter-terrorist operations, collective security, psychological operations, and civil affairs measures. Special Operations Forces Unified Commands are committed to specific areas of the world. The European area is designated as SOC Ur. The Atlantic area is designated as SOC Lant. The Pacific area is SOC PAC and the Latin American area is designated as SOC South. All other special operations forces are commanded by SOC Cent. For foreign internal defense. These soldiers are in the first phase of military training in their home countries by one of the special forces groups. They're being introduced into new equipment and training techniques that will allow them to eventually maintain the peace and security, foreign internal defense, of their own country for unconventional warfare. These soldiers are undergoing training in unconventional warfare using U.S. furnished equipment. Training consists of weapons proficiency, communications, medical, and operational techniques. Well, our leader here right now, our advisor, Tops, as he's known, he's great to me. And he's going to guide us, as I will guide my men in the future. And I want to say praise to them 
and to the American government, and especially the, the members of the Fort Bragg in North Carolina for the training I received from them. Thanks. For strategic or tactical reconnaissance, for strike, for strategic and tactical psychological operations. For civil affairs operations. Including civil administration. Well, we are hoping to not, not build it up there. We are hoping to rebuild it. For rescue. For evacuation. For humanitarian operations. Kind of get them in a position or a line. We'll take the youngest first and we'll work up to the oldest. Okay. Okay, I want you to put this in your mouth and chew it up, okay? You do that for me? Now chew it up. Give me a bite. For special aviation missions. For sabotage. Terrorism counteraction.
Special Operation Forces are ready. I'm Captain Kaufman, assigned to the 5th Special Forces Group, and I command the basic unit of Special Forces, the A Detachment. 54 A Detachments comprise the Special Forces Group, with an authorized strength of 1,200 officers and men. Special Forces Group consists of a Headquarters and Headquarters Company, Service Company, Military Intelligence Company, Signal Company, and three Operational Sea Detachments, also known as Special Forces Battalions. Within each Special Forces Battalion, there are three Operational B Detachments, also known as Special Forces Companies, with six A Detachments apiece. The missions of Special Forces are to conduct foreign internal defense, unconventional warfare operations, strategic reconnaissance, and strike operations in support of U.S. national objectives, military strategy, in times of peace or war. Special Forces A Detachments also conduct joint operations with our allied military units, whom we refer to as our counterpart forces. In order to accomplish these highly sensitive and important missions, Special Forces A Detachments are language trained and area oriented. This means that all detachments are targeted against specific areas of the world required to learn the language, geography, customs, traditions, and social mores of its people in order to work more cohesively with the local populace. At this time, I'd like to introduce my detachment. It's been specially formed to show its composite language capability, and military occupational skills. Each individual will explain his duties and responsibilities both in his foreign language specialty and in English. As the detachment commander, I am responsible for training and control the detachment. We are trained to work with foreign forces, however, we also have the capability of conducting unilateral strategic special operations, and I speak Chinese. Je suis lieutenant Sauter, l'officier adjoint et le commandant en second de détachement. I'm Lieutenant Soder, the detachment executive officer and second in command. My duties include supervision of all administrative and logistical matters of the detachment and our counterpart forces. We are prepared to provide advisory assistance in one or all of the following areas. Tactical operations, intelligence, psychological operations, and population and resource control. An inherent capability of this detachment is to split into two elements or strategic reconnaissance teams. I would command one of these teams. I speak French and Greek. Kapon Jap said Chun. Pon Pentahun Fai Youth Gun Led Jap said. I am Sergeant Chun, the operations sergeant and the senior non commissioned officer on the detachment. I advise the detachment commanding his counterpart on planning, operation, and training. I can advise and present instruction in small unit tactics such as raids, ambushes, and patrolling. I receive advanced training in parachute packing and light weapons. I'm cross trained in demolition and communication, and I speak Thai and Laos. Sono Sergente Borshu, the Sergente Intelligenza. I am Sergeant Borshu, the Intelligence Sergeant. I am trained in intelligence and counterintelligence operations. My responsibilities include a continuous analysis of the enemy, terrain, and local population. During low intensity insurgencies, I advise the detachment commander and his counterpart on methods of conducting denial operations, border surveillance, identification, and interrogation procedures. In the unconventional warfare mode, I advise the detachment commander and his counterpart on planning, training, and organizing clandestine intelligence operations to include escape and evasion nets. I'm cross-trained in light and heavy infantry weapons. I've received advanced training in Arctic, mountain, and pathfinder operations. I speak Italian and French. Yo soy Sargento Lozano, el médico del destacamento. Proveo el entrenamiento y el apoyo a nuestras fuerzas y las fuerzas aliadas. I am Sergeant Lozano, the medical supervisor. I train and support our counterpart forces. I am responsible for the health and welfare of the men of this detachment and to those indigenous personnel with whom we operate. I am proficient in all aspects of emergency medical care to include first aid, minor surgery, evacuation, sanitation, hospital administration, and medical supply procedures. I can organize and supervise first aid stations, field hospitals, and dental clinics. I have received advanced training in underwater operations, desert, jungle, and mountain operations. Additionally, I've been cross-trained in heavy weapons and communications. I speak Spanish. Soy Sargento Calero, el asistente médico. I am Sergeant Calero, the assistant medic. I have the same qualifications as the medical supervisor. 
We both participated in all patrols and special operations. Having worked in hospitals, we are prepared to provide outpatient care. I received advanced training in military operations in the desert, mountain, Arctic, jungle, and close quarters combat. I'm cross-trained in light and heavy weapons. I speak Spanish. I'm Rakit Stewart, Rakit El Mohandas. I am Sergeant Stewart, the engineer sergeant. I am responsible for all engineer training, construction projects, and demolition conducted by our detachment to our counterpart forces. I am trained in both American and foreign mines, booby traps, and explosives. I received advanced training in mountain, desert, Arctic, urban, and ranger operations. I'm cross-trained in light infantry weapons. I speak Arabic. I'm Sergeant Dekumag, the engineer specialist. I have the same basic skills as an engineer sergeant. With the aid of explosives, we can destroy both natural and man-made obstacles. I've received advanced training in jungle operations. I'm cross-trained in light weapons. I speak Lingala, French, Flemish, and Afrikaans. I have a basic working knowledge in English language. My name is Sergeant Irvin Hun. My body is Hun Kaagwa Hun. I am Sergeant Irvin, the heavy weapons leader. I'm responsible for all crew served weapons training conducted by our detachment to counter our forces. I am trained in both American and foreign crew served weapons. I am also prepared to present instruction in small unit tactics. During peacetime, I assist in training civil disturbance and disaster relief forces. My cross training and other skills permit me to work with local police and other security forces. I've received advanced training in military operations in the mountains, jungles, desert, ranger, and special operations. I'm cross trained in demolitions. I speak Urdu. I'm Rakib Gregory, El Rakib Leslie Head El Khafifa. I am Sergeant Gregory, the light weapons leader. I am responsible for all individual light weapons training conducted within this detachment and to our counterpart forces. My duties and responsibilities are similar to those of the heavy weapons leader. In a military assistance role, I can provide training in survival, methods of instruction, and small unit tactics. I received advanced training in military freefall parachuting and special operations and tactics. I'm cross-trained as a medic and in communications, I speak Arabic. Siak Sergeante Boncayo, Supervisor de Radio Aparador. I am Sergeant Boncayo, the Radio Operator Supervisor. My duties include maintaining a secure communications link from my detachment in the field to higher headquarters. I'm also trained to maintain my own radio net, plus advise counterpart forces in radio, wire, visual communications, and crypto systems. I have received advanced training in Ranger and Mountain Operations. I am cross-trained in light and heavy weapons. I speak Ilocano and German. Yes, Sir John McGinnis, Cloud Mary Redis. I am Sergeant McGinnis, the chief radio operator. I have the same basic skills as a radio operator supervisor. I operate the detachment's radios during scheduled contacts to higher headquarters. I can train counterpart